Excellencies, OGP leaders, a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Sanjay Pradhan. I'm the CEO of the Open Government Partnership. We meet at a time when democracy is under threat in many parts of the world. Civic freedoms are under attack in over 100 countries. Authoritarianism is on the rise and trust in government is at an all-time low. But it is precisely at this time, more than ever, that the Open Government Partnership with 75 countries, more and more local governments, and thousands of civil society organizations can serve as a countervailing force, a countervailing force to show a more hopeful path forward. Today, we have a historic opportunity and a moral imperative to show a better path which can actually deepen democracy and win trust back. To be sure, we see some of the same problems in some OGP countries. But what grounds and galvanizes our call to action today is that in many OGP countries, Courageous reformers from government and civil society have joined forces to put citizens first at the very heart of government. In Estonia, citizens crowdsourced and prioritized their policy proposals and ushered citizen-led legislation on political party financing. In Paris, citizens are setting their budget priorities to meet their needs. In Georgia, Ukraine, and Mongolia, citizens are following the public money, open contracts, and delivery of basic services, saving Ukraine $1 billion. In Nigeria, to combat grand corruption, oil, gas, and mining contracts, and company ownership is being opened for citizen oversight for the first time. In Chile, to curb influence peddling, Citizens can track and monitor meetings and donations between lobbyists and public officials. And at a time when several governments are shutting down voices, Latvia and Serbia are expanding civic space so more voices can be heard. These are inspirational reforms, but they are too few and too far between. We call upon government and civil society to join forces to transform these innovations into new global norms, a new social compact where citizens can shape and oversee open governments. Citizens can shape and oversee open government. As our founders transition, we call upon you political leaders and civil society to forge a global coalition which can galvanize and multiply political energy to propel the open government movement forward, prevail over the dark looming threats to democracy and put citizens first to deliver on that precious OGP promise of governments truly delivering and serving their citizens. With this, I now turn to Manish Bapna our civil society co-chair of OGP to moderate the proceedings. Manish, over to you. Great. Um, thank you, Sanjay, for that inspiring uh, call to action. Uh, just before I start, um, I, I do want to just uh, recognize, as you know, uh, just, just a couple hours ago, two earthquakes uh, struck uh, Mexico, very large earthquakes by both Mexico City uh, and Puebla, and the damage has been quite devastating. So I just want to take a moment uh, to recognize and extend our um, warm wishes and prayers uh, to the recovery effort in Mexico. Um, so just sorry about that. Um, really, truly pleased to be here with such a remarkable and distinguished audience, uh, especially, uh, especially like to recognize President Macron of France and his extraordinary team. He will be here in just a moment. His leadership, commitment to the Open Government Partnership has been invaluable, and it's been a real pleasure to be co-chair along with France. I'd also like to recognize my civil society colleagues, 
especially those on the front lines that are working to defend, protect, and advance the values of open government. As I stand here today, I think back to two years ago. It was a moment of hope and promise. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted here in this building. The Financing for Development Agenda was agreed to in Addis, and the landmark agreement on climate change was forged in Paris. These three agendas collectively aim to fulfill an audacious vision to end extreme poverty, to advance human prosperity, and to protect the planet for future generations. And open government plays an absolutely critical role in each. However, we must be honest. The reality is that the world has had a mixed record on open government in recent years. In many countries, authoritarian regimes and nationalist movements are on the rise. Journalists and civil society activists are at risk of being silenced or, or even killed. Trust in government is at a historic low. This is true even in countries that make up OGP. In just the past few months, several of the founders of our very own partnership have come under attack. Nikhil Day, a right to information activist in India, was sentenced to prison in a 20-year-old case for pursuing efforts to fight corruption at the village level on behalf of the voiceless. Fortunately, the sentence was suspended. AFRICOG, a Kenyan NGO founded by Gladwell Otiono, another founder of OGP, was accused of illegal activity for challenging the recent national election process. In last year, we had to suspend a country from OGP for the first time due to civic space issues. This isn't right, it's not acceptable, and we cannot remain silent. We must protect and promote the core values that bind this partnership together. What makes this partnership so unique and so powerful, what's in the DNA of this partnership, is a shared and unwavering commitment to civic space and to co-creation. And to achieve our mission, we must protect civic space, the bedrock rights of people to free speech, assembly, and association. Yet Civicus has reported serious violations of these rights in more than 100 countries, including 25 OGP countries. We must do better. Civic space needs to be a central component of OGP national action plans. And when governments violate the basic rights they promised to protect, we must speak up and take action. Second, we must stand up for co-creation. Placing citizens at the heart of OGP commitments is a promise we made as OGP. We must ensure that citizens have a voice in decision making and that leaders listen to these voices. Only in this way can we restore trust between those governing and the people whom they represent. As President Obama said in his last OGP speech, those in power should serve the people, not themselves. The reality is that today, open government is at a crossroads. If the world is to take the right path, we must be firm in our resolve, live up to our ideals, and build the political will to deliver on our promise. Who then can guide us in the right direction? Fortunately, you don't have to look far. We just need to tap the magnetic energy of the many, many champions here and around the world, and we need to lead by example. Look at, and I'll just ask them to raise their hands, look at Minister Andres Ibarra, Minister, from Argentina, who is leading the implementation of an ambitious action plan co-created with over 100 civil society organizations that includes commitments on climate change, gender equality, and subnational governance. Look at the leadership of the Open Society Foundation, who despite many attacks, have funded civil society around the world to advance open government. I don't know if Julie McCarthy, Chris Stone are here. Great, thank you. Look at Pablo Soto. Look at Pablo Soto from the city of Madrid, who's pioneered platforms such as Decide Madrid to engage citizens directly in policymaking and budgeting decisions. Pablo. Look, look, at, look at civil society leaders such as Olesan Oninbinde from Budget, who's helping citizens to follow the money and governments to respond to their findings in Nigeria. Is he here? 
And, and it's his birthday in Nigeria today, so happy birthday. Look at Mariyati Abdullah, one of OGP's envoys who's worked hard in Indonesia and the region broadly to advance extractive transparency. Is Mariyati here? She might be on her way. Well, thank you. Make no mistake, with this type of leadership, we have the power to change our communities, cities, and countries for the better. We have the ability to ensure the promise of open government turns into a re reality. For we know that while open government alone can't fix the world's problems, they can't be solved without it. It's time to get to work. Thank you very much. OK, so we are now going to, um, we are delighted uh, to have here the, uh, the new lead co-chair uh, from the government side, His Excellency Georgi Kashvili, Prime Minister of Georgia. Delighted to have you here, Prime Minister, and I'd like to, for you to take the floor and deliver your keynote remarks. Would you like to do it at the podium? That would be, as you wish. I can. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Manish. I would like to first join you in extending our prayers and wishes to the people of Mexico in uh, tackling the challenges uh, brought by earthquake. Um, your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, delegates, I am deeply honored and privileged to be among the hosts of this important gathering. Speaking to you today as an incoming chair of the most powerful global movement for openness and deeper democracies. Throughout our OGP journey, we have partnered with many of you, and we have followed good practices or shared our success stories with different stakeholders. I am thrilled to witness the results of the OGP countries illustrating across the globe openness of people to control their governments and willingness of people to control their governments. And yet we have many lessons to learn, not only from each other or from civil society organizations, but from entrepreneurs, journalists, startups, etc., who have knowledge of details that matter the most to achieve excellence in good governance. Hence, I welcome all of them and we are honored to have uh, these people participating in today's event. Notwithstanding the success, the theme of today's gathering is rebuilding trust in governance, an issue that requires a long-term strategy to tackle. I encourage all of you to use this time for exchange, debate, and collective reflection on how democracy can be reinvented. I would like to express our commitment to uh, continue efforts of France to strengthen OGP, and I would like to thank our French friends and colleagues for their efforts. Dear colleagues, exactly a year ago, we met and discussed the vision on questions such as how do we plan for the next years to ensure that we deliver transformational impact in the lives of citizens. And let me welcome the President of France. Hello, everybody. And once again, I would like to extend our gratitude for France's efforts and personally to President Macron for strengthening open governance, government partnership, and for their efforts um, to strengthen and to unite all of us in uh, tackling the challenges we all have. And the questions, uh, what are the specific steps we will take to broaden the focus from open data and open budgets to sustainable development goals, anti-corruption and service delivery which directly affect lives of ordinary citizens. How do we dominate focus on closing a feedback loop? 
And there are the key questions, these are the key questions my government used as a base to build our chairmanship vision. It is our government's honor to be trusted to serve as the next chair of OGP and contribute to a future for a powerful global movement for openness and deeper democracies. In the modern times, when innovation and technology have become leading pathways to success in the global economy, the definition of open governance has expanded. While advocating for enlarging the scenario, we aim to dedicate our courtier term to strengthen the basics of open government, to ensure people's opportunity to influence government decisions that affect their daily lives. Strategic goals, the Georgian government, together with our co-chair, Mr. Mukelani Dimba, will be dedicated to pursue our goal one, strengthening co-creation and citizen engagement. Goal two, advancing transparency and the fight against corruption. Goal three, generating innovation in public service delivery. And goal four is building a better partnership. Let me briefly explain the rationale behind our strategic goals. Goal one, this approach led to shaping one of the goals aiming to strengthen co-creation and citizen engagement. Practice shows that civic engagement in most cases is key to successful reforms that address the needs of the public, while on the other hand, leaving civil society outside the conversation damages democracy. Hence, it will be the co-chair's priority to ensure peer learning of successful experiences and promote innovations for further improvement. We also aim to propose concrete ways to advance reforms at the global, national, and sub-national levels in transparency and anti-corruption. And this is exactly what goal two means for us. Anti-corruption reforms continue to be the top priority for government of Georgia as a part of the overarching goal to enhance functional democracy, upholding principles of transparency, accountability, and the rule of law in the country. Georgia has a solid track record of combating corruption and creating institutionalized mechanisms for anti-corruption policy coordination and monitoring. Goal three, we have also set a goal to promote innovation in public service delivery. Georgia has gone through rapid transformation with notable success. And our reform priorities include ensuring unimpeded and efficient access to public services, even for those living in remote villages. These efforts bring public administration closer to citizens through the production of services more tailored to the needs of users. Experience shows that improving the design and quality of public services, coupled with the efforts to foster public participation through closing the feedback loop, is a process that enables government to build a real bridge connecting each and every citizen. We are willing to work with OGP countries to generate new ideas and take the public service delivery to the level that better responds to our citizens' needs. Goal four, regarding our goal to build a better partnership, we all come from different starting points and might have different priorities. However, strengthening the OGP is a common interest that should especially unite us. Today, OGP stands at a turning point where each of us should take responsibility in positioning OGP as a powerful global movement for achieving openness and deeper democracy, and as a countervailing force against the closing of civic space and distrust in government. And as we communicate the key values of OGP, let's emphasize the importance of inclusive approach of a governance as an indicator of success in achieving openness. Georgia prides itself to be among the few countries where all branches of the government are involved in the OGP process. We strongly believe that a comprehensive approach at the national level has defined Georgia's overall country performance in various directions. 
hence with the aim to foster the broadening of collective ownership of OGP domestically, we aim to encourage OGP participating countries to raise the bar of openness at the judicial, parliamentary, and subnational levels. I thank all countries for trusting us to serve as the chair of the partnership and stand ready to dedicate all our resources to make our tenure a success. I believe that in the era of globalization, success cannot be achieved without global partnership and mutual support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much. That, laying out such a bold and exciting vision for OGP. And as you mentioned, joining you as the incoming co-chair on the civil society side is Mukulani Dimba from South Africa, head of development at the International School for Transparency. He'll be giving some remarks after our roundtable discussion. I now have the distinct pleasure to invite my fellow co-chair on the government side, His Excellency Emmanuel Macron, President of the Republic of France, to deliver his opening remarks. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Manish. Mesdames et Messieurs. Ladies and gentlemen, members of OGP, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to be with you today. I'd just like to uh, apologize because I was to be with you, uh, but in a few minutes I have to join a, an event of the uh, SG, so I will let the minister, uh, Majubi, uh, come occupy the chair. But uh, as I'm here now, I'd like to share a few convictions in English and then draw some conclusions from the co-chairmanship with you, uh, Manish. I, I think what we are facing is a big challenge for our democracies. Why? Because our democracies are in a big trouble in Europe and some in this room do know how, it, I mean, that's a struggle sometimes to fight for democracy and its rules, because there is a strange fascination for illiberal democracies, because they seem more efficient, more streamlined. That's a pity or a shame, but that's it. And, and today there is a crisis of um, sovereignty, democracy, and trust. Mm -hmm. And our democracies do need more efficiency, more transparency, and more accountability. And I think it's, it's absolutely critical today. And digital is all about that, all about that. Our democracies first accepted the digital phenomenon as something coming from civil society and coming from people, which is true. And now the question is how to organize it on how for our democracies, to build the framework of this new phenomenon and use digital to be more efficient. And that's part of the revolution we need for our government, and a lot of you, I recognize some faces, uh, do this job in their country, in Europe and elsewhere. It's how to build more transparency, because that's how to, make, to create a permanent transparency with civil society, with citizens, and how to put more, in a certain way, equality between citizens through this transparency, but more incentives as well. And it's all about accountability. Mm -hmm. Because through the digital, its tools, mm -hmm. its innovation, it's as well how you can be responsive of your deeds, of your commitments, because everything is written and, and everything yeah. basically is, I mean, could be reached by uh, somebody in the society. So uh, I think that the question for our democracies, and all the people of this club today are very much aligned and convinced by that, but it's how to make digital an opportunity for our democracies, thanks to three principles, and not just to accept digitalization, and not just to organize it apart from the classical rules. And I think that's, that's probably one of the main challenge. And it's, I think this philosophy, which was followed by, by the French co-chairmanship co with Manish Bapna. Si je devais tirer en quelques mots les, 
In a few words, if I could draw some conclusions of the co-chairmanship that's finishing today, France had a main objective, which was to uh, conduct some specific actions and to build the toolbox in a way. Uh, internationally, which would allow us to uh, have an impact in the life of our fellow citizens and uh, to get into this transformation of our democracies. The Paris Declaration, after the uh, summit of uh, December 2016, uh, tried to immediately uh, establish a roadmap and lay down the commitments for our democracies uh, that we will do a better job uh, respecting integrity, transparency, accountability and help in the uh, digital and environmental transformations in society. Because space is not a transformation which is technological or technical, really. It is a true uh, civilizational transformation, which is changing our way of organizing uh, what we uh, ourselves conceptually and what our societies see in democracy. The first priority is uh, climate and sustainable development, mobilizing technology to uh, combat uh, de climate deregulation and to uh, help the planet. The second priority is transparency, integrity, and anti-corruption. Uh, throughout the world, the fact of corruption is uh, growing in many activities, unfortunately. It's uh, stopping socioeconomic development in a number of countries. It uh, really is uh, diminishing the trust of our citizens, and it, it could. What I would like to highlight specifically is that given this uh, tool box, box, what has been done, we can bring in more trans, uh, transparency in the public area, the public domain, more efficiency of economies to reduce corruption. What saps uh, trust we want to attack that? And uh, OGP is uh, onto this with an international uh, coalition on the contracting five. And the third priority are the uh, digital uh, common property. We initiated the uh, development of this toolbox uh, of, uh, for open government because there, too, this open platform, shared platform of all of us uh, must be uh, brought in to implement the principles I mentioned. We want to build new uh, open government spaces with uh, six new members into the OGP, Afghanistan, uh, Burkina Faso, Germany, Luxembourg, Jamaica, and Pakistan. Uh, local communities uh, have a, a growing role, and they're uh, absolutely uh, es essential for open governments. Uh, so I would like to welcome uh, and thank Paris for its example and all of those pilot program uh, localities. Uh, parliaments, oversight bodies, administrative bodies uh, are also in this movement, which for France is part of the... Uh, uh, part of our transparency offices and accountability offices. Uh, OP, OGP has met its uh, goals and its uh, commitments uh, with the ambitious goals as far as is, relates to the Francophone countries. More ef effectiveness, efficiency, more representation, more accountability. It's in this spirit that we have uh, watered our actions uh, that we are going to be conducting uh, in the first few months of my mandate. Uh, by uh, making our public life more uh, ethical, uh, more transparent, uh, more uh, digital, yes, but also by reforming institutional structures, which uh, sometimes have been just uh, stuck in their habits, uh, just r rolling along, but now... Uh, now participating in an open government with more online consultation and with institutional reform, which uh, I will bring in in the first quarter of 2018. So there will be more space given to civil society, to NGOs, to citizen groups to participate in establishing the, the norms and, and then uh, always assessing it because our democracies today, in a way, are stymied or have doubts that I mentioned a few minutes ago that our citizens no longer accept uh, being consulted uh, every X number of years to elect a government and then they give the keys to everything to the government. No, they want an ongoing uh, feedback uh, with uh, information, in ongoing institutional information that they can assess as to its effectiveness and decision making to evaluate, yes, but they also wish to participate in establishing the norms, standard building, uh, to propose and to uh, 
help build institutions, and this partnership then must move forward with these initiatives in this way, and France must set the example, uh, and that's the OGP spirit that will uh, feed these efforts that we will be undertaking. With uh, Monir, our minister, we will continue to work uh, so that there will be a new uh, public action model and for social organization as well, because our democracies, uh, digital democracies, uh, will never be the same. And anybody that thinks that it's a technological change only that will be digested, allowing us to do what we always did, that's wrong. Uh, there will be a digital transformation, uh, just like an environmental transformation. It's an in-depth change of our societies, our habits, how we represent. And so we must integrate all of this fully uh, to uh, bring them forward and to build the, f the democratic framework that will allow us to uh, meet these new challenges. We must uh, organize uh, our societies, bearing in mind the infinite possibilities for autonomy, access to knowledge, um, building intelligent cities. And we must uh, learn to live together in a world where information becomes uh, free and abundant. Uh, in a world of uh, robotics and artificial intelligence, we must also bear in mind the risks of excessive concentration of these new powers. And we must uh, deal with the new uh, perils uh, of cyber terrorism. And so you see all we've begun to undertake, this toolbox I mentioned, and which is the institutional transformation and organizational transformation of public action, uh, is thanks to uh, the digital. But there are continents before all of us. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't want to uh, scare you of your mandate, but new opportunities as well that will make us more effective and which will. Uh, transform the way we govern, but also new risks that go along with that. We must meet these by building as well uh, an environment uh, of, uh, that can deal with these, because uh, if our governments do not take on these subjects, um, specific, act, uh, specific uh, uh, actors will take charge of the uh, process. And anything that governments might do to protect their citizens uh, will be upset if we don't deal with uh, terrorism. Uh, with specific action groups and private interests, maybe that's a, a danger to our uh, security as well. If we don't uh, get in touch with AI and the consequences that might have on our methods of governing, the regulation of our societies, if we don't deal with those subjects, others will come in without regulation to take over, and then it will be the law of the jungle that will help that will go furthest in technology. So what we must uh, manage to rearticulate is our principles and uh, the technological evol evolution in civilization of these principles. And we must learn how to do it together. So that's what I wanted to share uh, with you too quickly, but uh, with a great deal of conviction. Uh, Mr. Mokuli Dimba, the successor and the co-presidents of uh, France with World Resources Institute, this has been very uh, rich, and next year uh, this will give us a great possibility for joint action. We must continue to build this international coalition to uh, put an end to close closure and in intolerance and other problems, and so we can be pragmatic and innovative about it. Partnership has a place, a growing place, in uh, countries uh, internationally. And in fact, it could become the international coalition, which will bring together all the innovators who are interested in the consequences of the digital revolution. Sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's of concern. Sometimes it pushes us forward. But we want it to be sustainable, value-creating, uh, economically speaking, these changes specifically, and we want it to be uh, in service of our philosophical values. So uh, once again, my support and commitment of our country within this partnership, and France will always be available and involved in the uh, uh, steering committee for the digital affairs. Thank you, friends and successor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I wanted to say the last few minutes, and I hope you have a successful meeting. Th th thank you very much. Um, brilliant speech, reinvigorating democracy, rebuilding trust in government. I, I, I think it, should, it cannot be overstated how important it is to have heads of state like yourself and the Mr. Prime Minister speak so passionately about these issues. If we're going to reinvigorate political leadership on these issues, if we're going to confront the challenges we're facing, 
um, the time that you take to speak out on this, these issues means, means a lot to this community, so thank you. Um, before, we're gonna take a, a photo opportunity, if we could, for 30 seconds, and um, then we're going to uh, move to our panel discussion, so if I could just ask the, uh, the co-chairs, incoming and lead, maybe we'll take, uh, we'll just stand, where would you like to? Right, just right here, we'll do it here. Okay. Great. Uh, we are going to uh, now move to our roundtable panel. We have a phenomenal lineup of speakers to talk about this, the, the, the issue of the day, rebuilding trust in government. You know, is, is democracy in danger? How can it be preserved, improved, and reinvented? Both uh, the President of France and the Prime Minister of Georgia raised these questions. What innovations and actors are changing the situation, contributing around the world to empowering citizens, improving political life, and public action? So we're gonna have now a round table panel, an opportunity to exchange, debate, and reflect around the challenges of building stronger democracies and how open government reforms can help rebuild citizens' trust. So I'd like to invite our panelists uh, for this round table. We have her Excellency, Kirsty Kaluliad, President of Estonia. Please, uh, please join me <laughs> on the panel. We have um, His Excellency Zoran Zaï, Prime Minister of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. <laughs> we have Winnie Bainyinima, Executive Director of Oxfam International and an Ambassador of OGP. We have Her Excellency Anna Helena Chacon Echeverria, Vice President of Costa Rica. We have uh, Franz Timmermans, the first Vice President of the European Commission. And we have Pablo Soto Bravo, Madrid City Council Member in charge of citizen participation, transparency, and open government. A warm welcome to our panelists. So uh, thank you all uh, for attending. And I'm, I'm really delighted uh, to have you answer some of these very uh, existential questions kind of on the future of open government. I want to start with you, Her uh, Excellency Kirsti uh, Kaluliad, President of Estonia. Um, Estonia has been a leader in e-government and now has recognized 
recognize the need to move from e-government to participatory government. Can you say a few words about how you feel governments can leverage digital tools to regain the trust of citizens? Thank you for this question. First of all, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. You have to have the trust of your citizens to start moving towards e-governance systems. Because one of the main obstacles of uh, developing e-governance is if the people do not trust their government to handle the information which in the digital world the government will have about people. It's so important that people know that if the communication between the state and the people is in digital format, that this information about this communication is a secret, a well-protected secret and that this information would never be used against people. So I would say, first of all, you need to start building the trust of your people. And if you then want to move on to the digital society and digital governance methods, the next step is to start with the simplest possible services. Also, I would advise Open your platform on which you are going to help your citizens to communicate with you digitally, also to the private sector. Because if public sector, private sector and people are all on the same platform, that actually is a trust enhancement method. And it's very inclusive. From the day one, you will have similar opportunities from digital society, both for people, businesses and also government. You must not put government above this process because what you are going to do is not you are not going to build a more automated bureaucracy because I'm sorry to say if you just automate a big bureaucracy you will have an automatically functioning big bureaucracy that you don't want. Not at all. It is change of society. It's societal change. Complete societal change where people realize that since the world has now moved into the digital sphere, in big parts of our lives, our people are in the internet, our businesses are all in the internet. The element right now lacking very often is governments. They are not there present for their people. And I tell you one thing, in the analog world, as we call it in Estonia, the real world as still called elsewhere, in the analog world, governments offer their people the secure way of identification of themselves. This is called passport. Now, what do you offer your people in digital world to safely identify themselves to each other, to government, to businesses? It's called digital identity, but there is a handful of countries only in the world who do offer this digital identity to their people. But yet, everybody who has access to digital services offered by private sector, our people, our businesses, elsewhere. They do transact over internet anyway, in the cybersphere, they do transact. And where do they get the identification? Not from governments. They have to rely on identification means provided by private sector. These do exist, but I think governments have actually given away or not accepted a vital responsibility. To make your people to trust digital societies, you need to give them the means to feel safe there, to talk safely, to transact safely over the internet. This is extremely important. And once you have understood what you are going to look for, a digital society which is safe in the internet, then it is time to start providing services. Start from something simple, school registrations, kindergarten registrations, or something which people really don't like to do like applying for social services and queuing long time in the government offices. And gradually will, you will build up the trust of your people for digital societies. Yet you cannot do it unless you as a government accept also to be transparent and sincere with your people. Because you would have to tell your people, if you trust me with your information, me the government, I'll take so good care of you that every time somebody checks this information, you will know. You will get an automatic notification and you will always have the right to know. This is a big obligation for the government as well.
but you have to take this obligation and you have to really keep this promise which you make to your people. And in this way, you know, digital world can really be trusted and digital governance can better be trusted than the analog governance. Because in analog world, you do not know who read your files. In digital world, you do know. So, if you get over this barrier and you get the services out there and your people are using them and you are reporting back to them on if somebody checked their data, then you are going to have a co-functioning of government, people and businesses in the digital sphere, which will feel safe for people to use. It's trust building, but again, we are back to square one in this sense. You cannot start unless your people already trust you to a certain extent to go through with these changes. Thank you for your attention. And sorry if I have to leave early. My uh, state speech in the uh, General Assembly is coming up, so I'm on borrowed time here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Um, hugely important topic. It's something that President Macron also spoke uh, quite passionately about, the role of digital in the broader open government movement. Um, I want to turn to His Excellency Zaev um, to talk a little bit about public participation. We know public participation in government is a fundamental pillar. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, you've come into government with a big political mandate to restore trust in government, how can, how can governments secure citizen engagement in a time when we currently face such a crisis of trust in public institutions? Thank you, dear Mr. Bapna, dear heads of states, media and civil society organization and representatives here, dear guests. First of all, allow me to express how honored I am to, pre to be present here today and discuss with you an issue that is important to both governments and the citizens. Rebuilding trust between governments, citizens, and organizations of various kinds is crucial for establishing transparent and vibrant democracies. Macedonia recently overcame a severe political crisis. Part of this crisis was the citizens Privacy was breached. The serious undermined the trust of the, of the citizens. The, new, the newly elected government of the Republic of Macedonia is well aware that the information and the communication technologies change our daily lives, but also change the mode of governance. I'm glad that within the framework of the Open Partnership Initiative, we can see how those could be utilized. In 2011, Macedonia became the 35th member of the Open Government Partnership, and we have made three action plans so far. The Ministry of Information Society and Administration coordinates the processes. It follows closely the implementation of the action plans and coordinates a participative action planning. 219 institutions 224 non-governmental organizations, 30 private sector actors, nine universities and seven diplomatic representatives provided their input in the creation of the current 2016-2011 action plan. We cover eight topics, 35 commitments and plan to achieve 100 goals. We have paid special attention to budget transparency and accountability of government institutions to standardize information of public procurement and narrative reports on health programs. The working group that supervises the implementation of the current, current uh, Open Government Partnership 2016-2018 envisions new mechanisms and involvement of greater numbers of stakeholders and remains focused on budget transparency public consultation and greater access to the technologies for greater number of citizens. We also find it important that the open government partnership goals are complementary with the sustainable development goals that address poverty, gender equality, clean water and sanitations, goal partnerships, cl climate actions and peace 
justice and strong institutions. In accordance with the aforementioned commitments, in the past decade, the government introduced various tools mostly aimed at providing citizens with information on its, its services, competences and regulations, including Open Data Gov, Uslugi Gov, Maka, Energy Gov, etc., etc. At the same time, various funds became increasingly available for both state institutions and civil society to develop democratic innovation utilizing internet communication technologies. I am glad that Macedonian startups, NGOs, and businesses, actors, push the boundaries and establish good practices. In recent years, we saw user-friendly public data visualizations, vote advice applications, whistleblower initiatives, and live open studio databases. There is a lot of examples. However, in the recent past, e-government initiatives went hand in hand with a decline in democracy in Macedonia on various dimensions. This mismatch of commitments and results in terms of democracy indicates the points I want to make it. Innovative solution will go as far as we, as a government, provides open and high quality data to citizens. Citizens can access variously, various applications, e-democracy platforms, and open data platforms. Yet, we are the ones who need to provide feedback and nurture engagement. Citizens engage when we engage. Our gathering today provides that world leaders are aware of, this friend, of these trends. My message today is let us give life to transparency and citizens' participation. Let us rebuild trust in government and democracy. As a newly elected government, one of our highest priorities is to show readiness to listen. We are eager to open up the data, see past government, and to improve it. We want to listen to our citizens because without their feedback, we walk in the dark. We work towards setting up mechanisms for continuous consultation with the government, our ministries, and agencies. We want to change the culture of communication. The Third Nation Action Plan of the Open Government Partnership will promote greater openness and possibilities for closer cooperation with all stakeholders. We can learn from each other but especially from the non-governmental actors involved and present today. There is a long way to go, and this initiative keeps us focused. Governments that want to serve their citizens are open. They do not hide, they reveal, rethink, and create with the citizens. We need to use the existing mechanisms and to create new ones to make our democratics robust. Thank you for your attention. Um, thank you, um, thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, th that topic of how to close the feedback loop, how to move from open data to citizen engagement to more effective policies and investments is going to be, I think, a very important theme for the partnership moving forward. And the story that you shared um, regarding what Macedonia is doing, hugely, hugely important. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to turn now to Winnie, uh, the OGP ambassador, the executive director of Oxfam International. Um, in the forward to this OGP publication that you co-authored with, uh, with Dr. Mo Ibrahim, you write about how process and values matter in policymaking. You lead an organization, Oxfam, that sets out to tackle poverty and injustice. How do you see the perceived gap in trust between government and citizens directly affecting people's lives? And what's driving the growing trend of decreasing trust in government? Thank you, Thank you Manish. It was an honor to contribute the forward together with my co-ambassador, Mo Ibrahim. It has got some really useful insights from 
practitioners, from thinkers, on why there's a loss of trust in public institutions and how we can regain the trust. I recommend that you put it in your hand luggage and read it on the plane back home. <laughs> so excellencies, participants and friends, this distrust actually surprises us, although it shouldn't. It surprises us because if you sit on a mountain top and look down on governance, you will see progress. In two decades, poverty has been halved. We live in a freer world, in a more open world. But then we know that things are not as good as that. There are problems. This year, I was in Northeast Nigeria. I was in South Sudan. People there are experiencing famine. Their voices are crowded out by, a co by conflicts, ferocious conflicts. They're, I have seen sitting in my place in Oxford on TV, young men and women who are, who are fleeing war, who are fleeing persecution, violation of their human rights, drowning in the Mediterranean on the shores of rich nations. Fortress Europe has shut its door and people are dying right at the door. So when we ask about loss of trust, these are the things. Millions of people, millions of hardworking people, men and women, see themselves as losers in a world where there are a few winners in this global economy. We work as Oxfam with talented people, talented women, hardworking women in many countries like Myanmar. These women earn $4 a day. They work 23 hours in a day. When they get sick, they don't get paid. When they get pregnant, they get fired. And these are the people fueling this so-called global su globalization success. The success is premised on their poverty. So you ask ourselves why there's loss of trust? It's loss of trust because there are millions who see a party going on for a small group at the top while they are losing. So we have to uh, tackle the issue of economic inequality. You know, there was a great man, a Supreme Court justice of this country called Louis Brandeis, who once said that you can have democracy or you can have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but you cannot have both. And governments are choosing inequality over democracy. Increasingly, they are repressive, cracking down on citizens who speak up against this injustice. Civicus, you talked about this. Civicus, an alliance dedicated to strengthening citizens, tells us that serious threats to civic freedoms exist in more than 100 countries today. Then Global Witness, another organization, has been tracking the numbers of human rights defenders, environmental defenders that are killed every year. Last year was the worst year on record. 200 killings across 24 countries. People trying to defend their right to their land, for example. So I'm afraid this economic model disdains democracy and trust. It does not encourage trust. We must reform this economic model. We must change it. We must build a human economy. And we want you governments to tackle this. You can take back control of your economies. You can you have lost control. You have allowed companies to maximize profits in the hands of shareholders to the loss of consumers, workers, suppliers. You must restore now, you must restore the economy so that businesses share power, share value with consumers, with workers, with suppliers, with farmers, with communities. That for us is the direction to take. 
It's about tackling inequality. And it's about governments taking back control and restructuring the economies and businesses to deliver justice. Right. Thank you. I, I, I was really struck by that quote that uh, from the Supreme Court justice, governments can have democracy or inequality, but not both. And I, I just, you know, Winnie, you and Oxfam reminds me of another quote from um, Albert Einstein. It's not that I am so smart, but I stay with the questions much longer. And I think you and Oxfam stay with the questions much longer to really get at the underlying root causes. So thank you. We have designed a new measure, an index. We call it the Commitment to Reduce Inequality, CRI. Mm. And we are going to be measuring governments. We've ranked 154 countries so far on how committed they are, how much they are going forward in putting in place policies to reduce inequality. And, and there are three areas. Progressive and effective taxation, spending on health, education, and social protection. And thirdly, commitment to policies on minimum wage, the rights of workers, and on conditions of work. Three areas. These can reduce inequality. And we're going to be telling you who's doing well and who is not. <laughs> and that would be hugely relevant for OGP, because if we care about open government, if we care about democracy, we must reduce inequality. Um, Franz uh, Timmermans, um, Mr. First Vice President, you gave, you gave a widely praised speech here at the UN Security Council as Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs after the Malaysian plane MH17 was shot down over Ukraine. You've also become known for your passionate defense of European values, like equality and the rule of law, for example, in debates with the Hungarian Prime Minister in Strasbourg or with the Polish Foreign Minister in Munich. Do you think that politicians demonstrating passion and values-driven leadership is a way to restore trust in institutions and democracy? Well, Emmanuel Macron did not win the election by informing people. He won the election by inspiring people. Um, but he couldn't have inspired people if they didn't trust his character and if they didn't trust his professionalism. Um, so it's a combination of factors that, that create that, that success. Um, what we see in, uh, in many parts of the world is um, uh, people have, have, have feelings of insecurity about their future. Uh, interestingly enough, people are not, uh, not always unhappy with the present, but they fear the future. And um, if you have governments who don't trust the people because it's, you know, we always talk about people trusting the governments, but you also have governments who don't trust the people. In a situation of insecurity, if you have governments who don't trust the people, they will take that insecurity, turn it into fear, and they will start feeding the fear. And then they will start to try and control uh, those uh, informations that um, lead to uh, their citizens forming an opinion. Uh, so you see in countries where re governments fear the people, they always uh, try to control the media um, via economic means or via political means or legal means. Um, the thing is, this will not work for a long time. It might work for some time. And sometimes you see even they can create trust through fear by saying we are the only ones that can protect you. Um, but creating trust with fear, uh, you need an enemy. You need an enemy, and the enemy is within, or the enemy is without, and the enemy is always the other, with another culture, another religion, or an another race. And if you start using that as a political tool, uh, it's like you know these tie-rip things. Um, they only go one way. Tighter and tighter and tighter. If you go down this road, you can never go back. And it will end in confrontation, and sadly also in violent confrontation, sooner or later, because you leave no room for people other than to defend themselves at the end of the day. 
So if you want to avoid that trap, but you do recognize that people fear loss of control of their destinies, you know, I think the winning argument in the Brexit debate in, in the United Kingdom was uh, the wish to regain control. Uh, and the, the question then is, how do you regain control? I think giving people much higher levels of transparency in government, sharing the possibilities but also the limitations of government. People aren't stupid. They understand that government can't deliver everything in their lives. They know they have a responsibility. And my experience is, if, you, if you're honest about that and open about that, we can do this, but we can't do that. This is what we can do, this is what we can't. Um, uh, you get the trust back. But you need to be entirely transparent about all of that. And also, if you make a mistake, be transparent about the mistake. Sorry, got that wrong, need to correct that. Um, and, and that is, is an attitude of, of creating, having a certain vulnerability uh, in politics, allowing criticism, giving the fullest of transparency possible. In my organization, every meeting with commissioners has to be made public. Um, we need to, people who want to see us who represent an interest, have to be registered publicly before we can meet with them. Uh, these are things that do help to create more trust. It's, it's, it's an element of that, but it's not all uh, we need to do. At the end of the day, and let me end on that, at the end of the day, it's about creating partnerships with all interested parties. And I want to echo what Emmanuel Macron said about this. We are no longer in a trust me society. We can no longer get a vote once every four or five years and then say to people, trust me, we'll take care of it, and at the end of the day, you can judge whether we did right, uh, it right or wrong. We're in a show me society. People want to see what we do and they want to be able to judge what we do on a daily basis. And if we don't adapt our political systems to that, I think the temptation to then go for the alternative in pandering lies and half-truths and creating fear in society as a means of, re of retaining political control, that is really uh, something that's happening too often in many uh, countries today. And that's why my proposition is don't only look uh, at it from the angle of citizens who don't trust their governments. Turn it around. There are also governments who don't trust their citizens, and that dictates their uh, behavior towards those citizens. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, First Vice President. Uh, really insightful kind of diagnosis of the trust challenge that we see in countries and, you know, no longer trust me but a show me society. Um, it's not just about citizens trusting governments. It's about governments trusting citizens. It's not about informing. It's about inspiring. Some great, great messages. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Her Excellency Ana Helena Chacon Echeverria, Vice President of Costa Rica. Madam, Madam Vice President, you've had a long track record of working with marginalized communities and advocating for human rights. One of the highlights of Costa Rica's National Action Plan is the consultation mechanism to engage indigenous communities. How has this enabled the country, the government, to build trust with members of these communities? Well, thank you very much and good night for everybody. I'm so glad to be here. I'll be speaking in Spanish. Para una costarricense, we come from a country that has had over 150 years of democracy. And it's important for us to see how we can improve our democracy. A country like Costa Rica with a very long history of democracy, the longest in Latin America, and it has to develop even better democracy. And to that end, we have consultations with indigenous peoples. And this enables me to be able to talk about how can we restore the faith of our indigenous communities in the government and in the democratic process. Indigenous peoples in my country have historically been vulnerable. 
and they they were in specific areas of the country and they lived in extreme poverty and moreover very little attention was given to their views in the democratic processes for a country like costa rica where democracy is uh, truly representative every four years all costa ricans are equal in one moment when they go to vote and uh, then the decisions are taken by the uh, politicians who've been elected and this is the same as in other countries in the region we need clarity and transparency in decision making so we are still working in building trust and uh, we also have to uh, pay more attention to the indigenous areas in this process. We have built a co system for consulting with indigenous peoples and this in, in accordance with the ILO convention. And under uh, President Solis Rivera's government, we have this clear system of how to consult with the indigenous peoples so that we can have an ongoing dialogue in a transparent and honest manner. And we are thus able to fully respect the traditions and customs of our peoples, and we ensure also respect for human rights. There are some areas where we have to really focus on protecting human rights. And here, I do believe that Costa Rica has tried to defend the human rights of all of our people. And as a second vice president, we have developed a dialogue, ongoing dialogue for affirmative action for persons with disabilities and also for peoples who, in historical terms, have suffered from vulnerability. And also, uh, there is an active LGBT uh, uh, minority, but they have been very active in our country. And so, uh, we are ensuring active participation uh, where we listen to what people have to say. This is the only way of improving democracy in a country is, which eliminated, uh, abolished the army in 1940 and has now been focusing on education. And also we try to invest in uh, universal health care and, and we try to reduce inequalities. Women are affected by inequalities even in our country and uh, we need to have a budget which is gender sensitive so that we can take account of indicators which measure any inequalities that we have to combat. So we have a uh, o OGP uh, plan of action and we are trying to make sure that our investments are made so that we invest in social groups that need our assistance, rural persons, those with disabilities, and all the different businesses. And uh, uh, we try to improve the quality of democracy by listening to people. And there is always an open dialogue uh, so that we can govern with transparency. And that is our slogan. We govern with transparency. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Madam Vice President. Hugely important, just you know, connecting that to what Winnie said earlier about democracy or inequality. And then you think a bit about you know, what, what this community has agreed in terms of the sustainable development goals and leaving no one behind. If we're serious about eradicating extreme poverty, of leaving no one behind, how we engage, listen to, respond to the needs and the interests of those that have typically been disadvantaged 
is hugely important. And I think some of the innovations that you have demonstrated in your country are important lessons for all of us uh, to learn from. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to now turn to Pablo Soto. Bravo. Uh, Madrid City Council member, as I mentioned earlier, in charge of citizen participation, transparency, and open government. In 2015, grassroots movements in Madrid created radical political change of city leadership with the election of Mayor Manuela Carmena and city council members such as yourself devoted to real democracy now. How has the city of Madrid delivered on their promise to engage people power and what role can subnational governments play in building the trust of citizens? Pablo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Manish. Thank you for, for the opportunity to have a, a, a councillor of a city like Madrid to be able to come here to the United Nations headquarters to speak with such a, a big number of interesting people and tell something very important that we come to tell you. Well, the first thing I wanted to clarify is that if people don't trust governments, they're, they're right. They're right not to trust the government. <laughs> well, if you ask anybody in the street who has the power, he's going to say probably the government. So the deal is that as long as the governments keep the power from themselves, people is right not trusting them. Now, to understand what happened in, in uh, 2015, uh, in Spain, I need to go back a little bit to 2011, the 15th of May, 2011. Uh, something happened in Spain, unexpectedly, a demonstration in 50 cities at the same time. It was a demonstration that was not baked by uh, political parties, traditional political parties, or workers' union, or traditional associations. And the slogan was, real democracy now. And suddenly, hundreds of thousands of people all over the they all over the country took the streets and say, we are the people and we want a real democracy. It's not about what party are you into it. We need to solve all the problems and the solution to all the problems is democracy. That was something that really changed the feeling in Spain. And four years later, nobody in the big old traditional parties had listened. So there was these uh, local elections in the more than 80 cities and villages in Spain and people created new parties on every city, and they won the election. They won in Madrid, they won in Barcelona. We won probably all of the big cities uh, and many tiny uh, villages as well. And what we uh, did was, well, what we were asking for in the streets. Uh, we were thinking, okay, real democracy, what is that? Well, the thing is that if people take the decisions, they have the power. If government takes the decision, people don't have the power. People will only have the power one day every four years. So we gave people uh, power, and people in Madrid is taking the decisions directly. People in Madrid decided to uh, remove traffic lanes from the main, like the Broadway of Madrid, Gran Vía, yeah. so people could walk over there. Uh, the, the, the building is, is going to start like in two months. Uh, they decided to uh, spend 160 million euros in more than 500 projects all over the city, changing uh, all the city, all the city, creating, for example, uh, houses for uh, women victims of violence uh, or creating daycare uh, spaces and centers for Alzheimer patients or creating help for buying books for families that probably have kids and don't have the money to buy books, uh, they uh, decided how the, the city is created from now. But how did, did we do it? Well, we uh, used several different mechanisms, some of which I'm sure you all know. You'll know that what's the participatory budget, right? It's a part of the budget that directly the people decides. We use another different also, which is very powerful, which is the, we call it the people's proposals. Basically, when somebody makes a proposal, if he's able to gather the support, the signature of 1%, just 1% of the people in Madrid will vote the proposal. But not the politicians, the people will vote. And if the people 
agrees with that proposal from that citizen, the government will have to obey. Um, we created a platform because we thought, okay, everybody's using social networks, everybody's using the internet. I myself was a software developer for 15 years, so why not doing it on the internet so people doesn't need uh, papers to gather the signatures in the streets? So created, we created Design Madrid, and uh, oh my God, people used it. Uh, 330,000 Madrilinians use it. I, I, I think that only Facebook is, uh, has more users uh, from Madrid. And uh, people is taking the decisions with the same Madrid all the time. Every new law that we approve gets debated and decided there. Uh, people's initiatives, uh, participative budgets every uh, year. But we also decided to make it open source. Because when we were talking about trust, we thought, well, people probably won't need to trust if they see what it is actually going on inside the machines. And happened several things. The first one is that they trusted it. But the second one is that hundreds of volunteers started reading the code and submitting improvements. And the third thing that happened was that more and more cities took the code. The first one was Barcelona. They call it this Decidim Barcelona. But now more than 50 cities all over the world use this technology that they also build with us. Uh, I think that five uh, subnational governments from the OGP, so the OGP for us was a great opportunity, Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires is doing a great job uh, with uh, participatory budget using what they call Buenos Aires uh, Elige, which is the same tool and we co-build, which is the site Madrid. So thank you for the opportunity to tell you, and it was so important for us to tell this year because maybe, maybe, just maybe, there's some country wanting to join in because people is taking decisions all over the world. They are starting to take their cities to make the decisions directly, their proposals. Maybe one country is the next step. So want to join in? <laughs> Thank you. Great. Um Thank, thank you, Pablo. Uh, such such a you know a vivid example, kind of an open government. And as many of you know, Madrid is one of the pioneer cities in the subnational pilot program for OGP. And it was the success that you heard in Madrid and many other subnational entities around the world, which is why we are ex planning to expand this pilot program into something bigger, because this type of reform can take place not just at the national level but at many le different levels um, in government. So thank you, Pablo. Please join me, a warm round of applause for all four, uh, all six of the panelists. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, just it reminds me, I, I, have, I have young kids and they, uh, they still uh, read kind of Dr. Seuss and my younger son came back to me with this quote and it just reminds me of all of you uh, from the Lorax. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And I just wanted to thank you all for your time and your efforts. Uh, okay, so we are going to change uh, the tone a little bit. Uh, we, got, we got two more short pitches from people working on real life kind of innovations on the ground. We're going to have Tanya Itamorta who is a postdoctoral scholar at the Crowdsource Democracy Team at Stanford University. If I could ask her um, to please come up, and we are going to have also Olisam Onijbende, the co-founder of Budget It, going to give you short, brief um, pitches on some of the interesting innovations that they are doing around open government. So let me, let me um, give it over to Tanya, clear some sense. Thank you, and thanks a lot for having me here. This is a great honor, and what would be um, a most appropriate topic and most relevant topic than uh, trying to find out ways how we can recover trust to our governments when the world is melting all around us. Um, today I want to talk about the value of open government practices, and we have been talking about that here and keep on talking about uh, the topic for the next um, still uh, 30 minutes and so. But I want to emphasize what do we mean with open government methods and practices 
and the value of those practices. Why are we actually doing those? And here, when I talk about open government practices, I mean methods that increase transparency in the government and citizens' cooperation with the government, as the previous examples here show. And I have been developing these type of methods uh, with my first home country, Finland, where I'm from, and uh, in the past 10 years, my new home country, the United States, I work with local and national governments in these countries. And why I want to talk about the value of open government practices is because I feel like we oftentimes bypass the actual value of these practices, and we just emphasize the role of technology, as if we were using these practices for the sake of the technology because we have all these cool technologies like artificial intelligence and so on and then we want to somehow apply it in our democracy thinking that only that would make our democracy better but that's not the case and but then why do we then actually want to use open government practices like open data um, crowdsource policy making and so on what is the goal for that and the goal for that is to create value value for all of us with all of us and how this works is that, this is what our research shows, is that when we have people participating online, for instance, in a lawmaking process or an urban planning process, these participants, our citizens, they feel more empowered, they feel more connected to our government, and also they learn from each other, and also they learn from the experts like civil servants who are present on those platforms. And this participatory experiences can be really profound, actually surprisingly profound. I'll give an example. In Finland, the Ministry of the Environment decided to use crowdsourcing in a law reform process. The law was about off-road traffic, so it regulates where people can ride snowmobiles in Finland. That's a very important topic, of course. Finland is like the Alaska of the United States. And crowdsourcing here means that people were invited to submit their comments and ideas to the law online. So the Ministry of the Environment decided that let's not do the law reform only by ourselves, like we typically do it, but let's invite the citizens to participate in with it. And then in my study, I interviewed many of these participants who submitted their ideas online. And one of them, said a really profound quote that I want to tell here. Um, and many others' comments also echoed this. So this person was called Jaska. He was a very regular Finnish uh, man living in a very remote area. Uh, he's a regular voter, and he's part of a, like a local um, civil society activity. So he's part of democracy already. But this is what he said after he had submitted his idea to this crowdsourced off-road traffic law reform. He said that, this is actually the first time in my lifetime when I feel that I'm participating in making of democracy and influencing the decision-making in this society. It feels much more real than just voting for some person. And may I repeat, it feels much more real than just voting for some person. And what this person, this Finnish man had done was just to submit his ideas to this crowdsourced law reform process. So this is an example of how a rather simple activity can create a really profound experience to a citizen, an experience that connects him to the democracy that he's actually part of. And that's the problem that we are facing here, is that as is currently, our citizens don't trust in the government because they feel alienated. They feel that the government is done for the other people, not for them, and it's done by the others, not by them. And this is something that we have to change, and this is something that we can change if we only want to, because the methods, methods are here, people are willing and able to participate, and it's not complicated processes or expensive processes that we are talking about. But the change should start from us, if we as experts and country leaders want to implement, implement open government practices, we can really do it. And that's what we should do because nobody else in this age will be doing it and we really owe it to our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, let me now turn it over to Alyssa, if you'd like to. And you may recall it is his birthday today, so, so clap loudly. <laughs> All right, um, thank you very, very much. Um, 
very opportune, uh, very great opportunity to speak to you. And I know we've read a lot about trust. How do we build trust in government, uh, between government and the citizens? And for Nigeria, uh, we always call it an evolving democracy, because if you stayed 20 years in um, in military regimes, um, it could actually be out of dictatorship, but sometimes psychologically you're still in there. And something the OGP has done effectively for our organization, for civil society in Nigeria, is to create a formal structure where government and citizens have a permanent dialogue mechanism to talk about issues that really, really matter to them. And these are issues around resource efficiency. Nigeria is an oil producing country. And we all know that despite the huge amount of funds that has been plowed from the whole industry, um, the Nigerian social indicators do not reflect that at all. So we also have conversations around citizen engagement. And so the OGP has been a big instrument for us. And we have been seeing examples directly to our own work. For example, the Budget Office of Nigeria, uh, which we have been having some bit of trouble with in the past, suddenly find OGP as the right mechanism to always have constant meetings and to have updates about the key challenges that they are facing. And so for a long time, we now have the budget implementation reports being published. Uh, we now have more conversation about opening up a citizen budget portal, which has been opened up by the government. And so the conversation helps us and the OGP has been the key midwife in that space. Second thing that has happened also for us is to talk about the, our National Assembly. Um, for eight years, suddenly the National Assembly in Nigeria stopped publishing its budget. And it's been a big worry for us. Uh, how do you get close to $300 million every year, but nobody gets to know where exactly you spend that money on? And we started a campaign, a very strong campaign, um, as an organization with budget. And, um, we, and we, with all other partners, and the conversation where we need to get this budget published. Not just a single line item, we want to see the details of how the budget is published. And with the conversations through the OGP dialogue mechanism, talking to the National Assembly, using the OGP Secretariat, finally we have the budget of National Assembly published just this year, and we hope it will not stop. Now, we want, when we talk about OGP in Nigeria, the conversation has been we want to lead, in, not just in West Africa, we want to lead in Africa. And it's a bit surprising for me that um, subnational governments are inching to join the OGP subnational program. And we have had three state governors who have shown immense interest, who are ready to drop the national action plan. Um, Kaduna is taking the leap. Um, other two states, Kano and uh, a number of states are also interested. And the Secretariat has set a very ambitious plan that out of 36 states in Nigeria, we're going to have 20 states in the whole GP framework by 2019. I feel like that would be so, so huge. But it's something that we see that a lot of people uh, believe that for us to fight corruption in Nigeria, for us to have an efficient government, for us to build trust in government, we need to create a permanent dialogue within citizens, key stakeholders, and the government. And for us, uh, as budget, we were looking at this forward. We're going to have elections in 2019, and it's always going to be early in 2019, and 2018 will be the time for the politicking, and there's always the danger that people tend to forget about this great governance stuff and just focus about politicking. And we are the conversation is how do we shield the entire OGP framework from that political economy and ensure that that vigilance is there. The key action plan, national action plan, the key commitment that we have there, that's supposed to deliver in 2018, and supposed to deliver in 2019, they are effectively implemented. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Incredibly inspiring um, stories of real world, you know, innovations related to open government. Um, and now also my real uh, privilege and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, once again the incoming uh, co-chairs for the Open Government Partnership, uh, the government of Georgia, Minister Thea Sulakiani and Mukulani Dimba. Minister, over to you. Um, thank you very much, and let me welcome all of you here uh, and greet um, our dear friend, Mr. Um, Dimba, who will be co-chairing with us next year this very important partnership where we all are united. And um, let me um, tell you publicly that we do count on your um, support and advice because 
that's how we do see this partnership, that when two, um, let's say so, entities are co-chairing, then we share, of course, different views. We can have uh, sometimes differences of point of views, not differences of views, but point of views can be different because we do see the different processes from different points of views. But the importance is that we will be co-chairing together and I wish you all the success and fruitful cooperation with us. Thank you, please. Mukalani, we would love to hear your thoughts on the future of open government. Uh, thank you, Manish. Uh, good afternoon, honored guests, colleagues and friends of the OGP. Um, before I make my short input, I would like firstly to thank my colleagues, both from the government side and the civil society side in the steering committee, who have entrusted in me this responsibility to be one of the uh, lead chairs of the OGP. If you allow me, Manish, I would like to speak from the heart, speaking as I would if I were an ordinary citizen out in Lagos, out in Kinshasa, out in Soweto, ordinary citizens who do not ever have an opportunity to occupy platforms like these and speak their minds about what they expect from their governments. We meet here today under the theme, how can open government help rebuild, uh, renew democracy and rebuild citizens' trust? Meanwhile, the theme for this year's UNGA uh, session is focusing on people, striving for peace and a decent life for all on a sustainable planet. Both these themes speak very uh, directly to my own motivation for being part of the OGP community. I was born in apartheid South Africa. I was born during a time when apartheid was at its most brutal. The apartheid system was a system of government which operated in total secrecy. It was a system of government, government that was vicious. It was brutal. It was operating in a manner that had no connection whatsoever with the needs of the people. Therefore, when I think about issues of governance, my key reference point is the apartheid system. And through that reference point, I get to analyze what governance should be, what governance should not be. And so, when I think about how we advance open governance, I tend to draw from that experience. In my experience, I've witnessed the liberation movement in South Africa defeat the system of apartheid and introduce a new vision, a vision of a government chosen by the people, a government that is there to provide the needs of the people, a government that is accountable for its own actions. While the apartheid governments were loathed and feared, the new government was supposed to be a government that enjoys the trust of the people. So when the first democratic elections in South Africa took place in 1994, I was only 17 years old and therefore did not qualify to vote. But I did try my luck. <laughs> Unfortunately, I was found out and never made it to the voting booth. However, that vision of what a government should be is the one that has stayed with me all my life and has influenced my own career choices. I believe that open governance is not good just in and of itself, but if it, it's good if it really changes fundamentally how governments deliver services to those that depend on government services for their dignity and their survival. As co-chairs, the government of Georgia and myself intend to encourage OGP member countries to link OGP to, to the sustainable development agenda. We want to encourage OGP governments and countries to develop national action plan commitments that relate directly to the realization of better outcomes in governance, access to justice, and socioeconomic rights. I appeal to OGP countries to place the daily needs and concerns of your people at the forefront of your OGP innovations. 
The strategic refresh uh, process has identified public services as a promising area which, in which OGP can help deliver reforms that speak directly to the needs of the people. Citizens can bring an unprecedented scale of eyes, ears, and voices into the process of service delivery. They can help monitor the allocation of public resources. Governments can invite and enable a sharpened focus on real issues with real and concrete outcomes for the people. This creates more appetite for participation by citizens and builds trust in government. For example, we have seen some of the OGP commitments that speak to this issue. In Seoul, South Korea, we have seen how citizens' trust in the public water supply system has increased. The tap water consumption uh, has also gone up 20% after government began to publish real and accurate information around the quality of water being delivered to people's homes. There are a number of these good examples. However, they still remain few and far uh, apart. They are few and, and, and far in between. It is clear that we have a huge task ahead of us to make the OGP that great enabler of the efforts aimed at meeting ordinary people's lives. Manish, I would like to conclude my, my remark today by drawing back to that great South African hero, Nelson Mandela, who, when he spoke at the UN General Assembly 23 years ago, he said, the society we seek to create must be a people-centered society. All its institutions and all its resources must be dedicated to the pursuit of a better life for all our citizens. The better life must mean an end to poverty, to joblessness, to homelessness, and despair that comes from deprivation. This is an end in itself because happiness of the human being in any society must be an end in itself. What Nelson Mandela said at the UN 23 years ago still holds even today. And it can be said to the OGP. Therefore, I would like to invite you all to do whatever you have in your ability to link OGP to what your citizens, your communities are most concerned about. And these are issues of dignity. These are issues of sustaining livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you, Mukulani. That truly inspiring speech. And to both the government in Georgia and Mukulani, you know, OGP, we've talked a lot about how it's facing some strong headwinds um, in terms of authoritarian kind of movements and forces. But I, I feel incredibly encouraged and inspired that the leadership of this partnership moving forward so strongly embodies the values of what binds this partnership together. And both what Georgia is doing and Mukulani, your personal story and the story of the organizations that you represent um, is what is gonna be able to help us stay true and focused over the coming years to realize the promise of the Open Government Partnership. So thank you, thank you both very much. A warm round of applause. I, I, I have one um, final um, remark to make, uh, but Sanjay has a remark as well. So I'm wondering, <laughs> mine might close the session. Yes. So maybe if you would like to. So I just wanted to take this opportunity as we are transitioning from the outgoing chairs to the incoming chairs to, for, for the whole community to join me in thanking very much uh, the government of France and Manish Papna WRI yes. for an outstanding, please, please stand, stand, stand. <laughs> please stand. Come on. You guys have been awesome. Absolutely awesome. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> So one last piece of business. Uh, a, former, a, a former prime minister of India, Indira Gandhi, once said, there are two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. Try to be in the first group. There's a lot less competition there. 
And there are a lot of people here who, as many of you may know, pulling off an event like this is not an easy task. Um, massively complex schedules, lots of people who care to speak, a deeply important issue. So I just want to take 30 seconds to ask those that were largely central in organizing this event to please stand up, come to the front for just a final round of applause. Um, I'd like to start with France, Laure, Amalie, Rachel, Mathilde. Please, please come up. From Georgia, Zorab, Ketty, and from the support unit, Megan, Jaime, Tonu, Latte, Abhinav, Alonzo, Paul, Stephanie, Jessica, Rachel, Jessica, Jackie, Joe, and Sanjay. Please, please, all of you, come up. Now, um, as, as we Support close, unit people, come. Please, support unit, please come up. We know, um, look, it's not just this event, but orchestrating um, this partnership, helping make sure the government, civil society, lives up to its promise. It was six years ago tomorrow that this partnership was founded. And when one thinks back at what has changed in those six years and what this partnership has managed to achieve, it's incredibly inspiring. And so just another warm round of applause and a photo for all of these people who helped make that happen. Thank you very much.